uh, to the Department of Transportation. And I'm also one of Minnesota's three TZD co-chairs and the state, uh, and I already said that. <laughs> I'd like to start out by thanking our hosts and uh, our all-around sponsors, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Minnesota Departments of Health, Public Safety, and Transportation. Before we start, just wanna make sure you know a few things. The webinar is being recorded. Um, all attendees are muted. You will be able to find useful items on the Minnesota TZD website after today's webinar, uh, including PDF copies of um, Derek's PowerPoint, a PDH form for continuing education credits, and a recording of today's event so you can enjoy a second helping of the hot dish. Or it might be that there's someone you know who couldn't join us this morning that might be interested in today's hot dish. Of course, they can find it, as I mentioned, on the website. Uh, video and audio of all participants is turned off, but you can communicate with the speaker or other participants using the chat and Q&A boxes at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can use the chat feature to introduce yourself, share ideas with participants, or let us know if you're having IT issues. Uh, there may be times when we prompt discussion and ask a few questions through the chat box, so please share your ideas that way. We encourage interaction and discussion through the chat. Note that you can send a chat to all panelists or all panelists and attendees, so choose wisely. Uh, and then you can use the Q&A feature if you have a question for our speaker, so I'll keep an eye on that throughout the presentation. If there's a question that's relevant and easy to answer in the moment, I may share it with the speaker during the presentation. Otherwise, we should have plenty of time at the end for questions after Derek is finished with his presentation. So our speaker today, many of you likely know Derek Luer. Derek is the state traffic safety engineer for the Minnesota Department of Transportation in the Office of Traffic Engineering. He, is, he has been responsible for the development of the district and local road safety plans, assisting in statewide traffic safety planning efforts, and providing technical assistance to state, county, and local agencies. Derek has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from North Dakota State University, and a master's in infrastructure systems engineering from the University of Minnesota. He is a registered professional engineer in Minnesota, and he wanted me to mention he is also an amateur history nerd, which is going to come through, I think, very clearly in this presentation. So um, looking forward very much, Derek, to your presentation this morning. And with that, I will pass it over to you. All right. Thank you, Brian. And thanks for the presentation uh, and, and welcome, everybody, this morning. Uh, I was I was hoping today would be one of those nice squelching 95 degree days so I could share how important the air conditioner was and you guys would all intuitively understand what I'm talking about. But uh, it looks like it's a fairly nice day out. So uh, thank you for joining me today. And I'm going to hop right into this. I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Can everybody see my screen right now? Looks good, yep. Derek. Looks All right. good. All right. So my presentation today is uh, air conditioning, land development, access management, and pedestrian fatalities. How are they all connected? Um, so I'll, I'll kind of walk through this. There's going to be kind of some overall arches that you might want to kind of follow along on. But, you know, really, uh, I'm, I'm not getting at the point of uh, the Homer Simpson, can we live in the refrigerator for the rest of the summer? But um, I, th I thought that was a great picture to highlight air conditioning. So. Here's kind of the agenda of what I'll be walking through. I'm, I'm going to start with a little story from World War II. I'm going to talk a little bit about air conditioning, the advent of the technology, access management, the development, the pedestrian fatalities. How do these all things all tie together? What do we learn? And then, um, you know, what, what were some of our lessons learned overall? So, all right. I want everybody to hop into the Wayback Machine with me and, and go back to the 1940s Europe, and specifically 1942 uh, in Europe. And uh, for those who are not amateur history nerds or just need a brief uh, refresher, uh, 1940 in Europe, there was, a, there was a big war going on. It was World War II. Uh, Germany had pretty much uh, trampled France. They were bombing uh, Britain. Uh, they were invading Russia. And starting in 1942, the tide started to swing against Germany. 
And um, as part of that tides changed, uh, the British and the Americans were planning to reinvade Europe. And as part of that plan, they decided that a big part of the, the German war machine, which was really cranking out massive amounts of tanks, uh, trucks, artillery, everything you need for a war, was really uh, going to be a big impetus to reinvading Europe. So they started this extensive campaign across Europe to, to cripple the German war machine. And really, what this really entailed was using bombers. Uh, the, the, the Army Air Force was going to bomb Germany day and night industrial and all the industrial centers and infrastructure, ro roads, bridges, highways, um, everything they could do to slow down the German war machine and um, really give the advantage back to the allies. Uh, the trouble was, especially in 1942 and 1943, where the bombers were taking extraordinarily heavy casualties. Uh, every bomber that went over Europe had a very high probability of not returning. Um, and really for the for the airmen, for the pilots who were in these planes and running over Germany at night and during the daytime, it was really pushing human psychological limits to the maximum. Um, every mission was almost seen as a suicide mission. And really the Army Air Force at that time decided that the only way they could keep the men engaged, could keep the, the spirits high, uh, to keep morality high, was really to give them this uh, kind of this rule of thumb that if you could fly 30 missions over Europe and uh, land safely on that 30th mission, the war was over for you. You got to go home. You were done. Um, and really, it gave a lot of the airmen and pilots a, a really good objective to hit to, um, to, to fly those 30 missions. Because if it had gone on indefinitely, uh, most probably would have broke, um, and, and uh, the Air Force would not have been as effective. The problem was, too, that even getting to that 30 missions, it was estimated that really um, you had about a 71% chance of being killed in action or to go missing in action in those 30 missions. So the probability was extraordinarily against the airmen and the pilots who were flying in these bombers. So the Army Air Force knew they had an issue. They knew they had to do something. They had to give their pilots and the airmen a better chance. And um, so enters a man by the name of Abraham Wald. So now Abraham Wald was a mathematician and statistician professor from Hungary. He was actually a Hungarian Jew. Uh, he kind of saw the writing on the wall in the 1930s with the Nazis in, in Europe and decided to get out uh, well, he could, and he actually came to Princeton University, where he set up a statics and math and math uh, program, uh, and started doing a lot of interesting research and kind of looking at things a, a lot differently. And um, kind of in about 1942, there, the Army Air Force came to Abraham Wald and and kind of asked him, you know, what can we do to increase the survival of our airmen, our pilots, and our planes returning? What can we do to give them a better odds? Um, one thing the Army Air Force kind of came up pretty quickly was like, let's add armor. Let's get armor onto our planes. Uh, they're, they're taking a lot of bullets. They're taking a lot of flak from the ground. Um, if we can add some armor, we can maybe give them a better probability of survival. Um, but they knew this too. If, if you give them too little armor, it was essentially useless. If you gave them too much, it would really slow down the planes. It would make them really sluggish, really hard to handle. So they knew they couldn't add too much armor. Um, so they had to figure out what was that balance? How much armor can we add? And then even more importantly, where do we add the armor? Where can we put the armor on the plane where it's going to be most effective to increase the survival of the, of the pilots and the planes? So the good thing was the Army Air Force had lots of data. They, they were starting to look at this problem. And every time a plane touched back down after running over Europe, they would, uh, over Germany, they would come out and they would measure where the bullet holes were, the size of the bullet holes, the number of bullet holes, and started to pull together these diagrams and trying to figure out, you know, just to give data so they could start to review this problem kind of more of a systemic basis. Um, and what they found was kind of the rear engines of the plane had this about 1.1 bullet holes per square foot. The, the fuselage was getting about 1.7 bullet holes per square foot. Uh, the tail was coming in at about 2.1 bullet holes per square foot. Um, and then the fuel system lines were coming in about 1.6 bullet holes per square foot. So they had all this really great data and they kind of averaged it all out and they were finding we're seeing about 1.8 bullet holes per square foot. Um, and they gave all this data to Abraham Wald and they asked him, where would you put the armor? Where, where should we put this armor? Where is it gonna be most effective? So that's the question I wanna post to everybody who's watching this, this webinar right now is, I want you to think about this. Where would you put the armor? Think about that during the presentation. Don't dwell on it too much, but I just wanna get people's kind of uh, creative juices, crit critical thinking skills going um, as I hop into this presentation. So now, pause. I want you to hop back in the Wayback Machine and we're going to go back even further. Uh, we're going to go back to 1902 uh, in New Jersey. And there was this company by the name of Sackett and Wilhelm Lithography Company. 
lithography is just the fancy name for printing. Um, and they did a lot of printing year round. Uh, but what they really started to find was that in the summer, they started to get a lot of issues, especially with a lot of the newer machines that could really press a lot of paper really quickly. Uh, but during the summer, this really became problematic, and especially as it got hotter and it got more humid out. Uh, what they found was that the paper, due to the humidity, would start to curl. And when it would curl, it would kind of start to, it would get kind of this wet, dampy feeling to it. It would start to curl. And as it started to get fed into the machines, it would start to jam up and bind up the machines and really kind of stop the operation um, as a whole. Um, and it was a really big problem. It kind of essentially stopped their business and they really needed to continue through the business. So or through the summer. Um, so they kind of approached a, a young mechanical engineer, a uh, guy by the name of Willis Carrier, and they asked him, hey, can you help us with this problem? This, and they kind of really, really started with a, you know, solving the printing press problem, but really Willis Carrier kind of looked at it from another perspective and said, hey, what if we could get the moisture out of the air? Um, would, would that solve the problem? And so he came up with this huge system of um, these big pumps that would pump the air over these metal coils. And what they would do with the metal coils is they pumped liquid ammonia through the coils. And that liquid ammonia would actually end up pulling it was the, the metal coils the metal coils would get really cold and then with that coolness it would actually dry it make the, the water vapor in the air condense out and it pulled all the moisture out of the room out of the air in the in the enclosed room um and it worked really well um but the unanticipated effect was that uh by pumping this air over these cool metals was ultimately really cooled down the room as well um so not only did you pull out the moisture you pulled out the the heat in the room as well it made the room significantly cooler Hence the advent of air conditioning. Um, what what uh, the, the company found too, though, was it, it was pretty expensive to run. This was not a cheap system. Uh, it was not a simple system, um, but it, despite being expensive to run, it, it worked and it worked really well. And it worked well enough to where they could continue their operations throughout the summer. They were probably one of the only few printing presses in town that could continue through the summer unabated. Um, and what they found too was over time was that uh, the employees found out that this room was significantly cooler and it really kind of became the favorite place to eat lunch. And uh, Willis Carrier, who had to kind of come back and check on the system and fix it regularly and just provide maintenance, started noticing that all these employees would come to this room during lunch and eat their lunch because it, it was the favorite place to eat. It was the only cool place around. Um, so Carrier kind of started asking himself like, hey, this, this looks like a, a good idea for beyond just lithography and, and printing. Uh, what else can I do to market and sell this item? This this might be a thing, right? So um, he came up with the idea. His, his first idea to, to really market this to was um, movie theaters. And really before the advent of, of air conditioning, uh, the movie theater was not really a great place to go in the middle of the summer. It was hot. It was muggy. There was no air movement. It was really the last place you wanted to see. A lot of movie theaters shut down in the summer just because they couldn't get anybody to come in anymore. Um, but he started to market this to movie theaters and said, hey, you guys could be the cool place in town. You could be the coolest place and people would want to come to the movie theater, not only to watch movies, but to just enjoy some nice, cool air and get out of the heat for a while. Um, as he started to sell these and the theater started to buy them, they were expensive. They were bulky. A lot of people saw these as a luxury, but really it, um, it, it worked. It drew people in. People actually wanted to come to the movie theater in the middle of the summer um, and watch movies. And the, the movie theaters were able to recoup their costs and actually pull a profit through the summer um, during a time when they were normally shut down. Um, now, it was bulky. As I said, it was a luxury. Many saw it as so um, it, it didn't catch on right away. It was, this was not something that was transformative overnight. It did not revolutionize society all in, in one year or one decade. But over time, uh, they became more efficient. Air conditioners became more efficient. They became uh, smaller. Um, and then cheaper power, uh, ultimately what you need to run the air conditioner, this, this changed everything. Uh, Willis Carrier uh, said in 1929, air conditioning and cooling for summer may become a necessity rather than a luxury. And we will look upon present times as marking the end of that dark age in which there was but relatively little cooling for human comfort. Um, and, and this really would have a huge impact on the southern U.S. Um, and right now, you've probably read even in the news, uh, in, in southwestern U.S., there's what we call the heat dome right now. Temperatures of 110 plus um, across much of the south, typically temperatures range above 100. 
Sometimes that's a dry heat. Sometimes that's a, summer, uh, a, a moist heat. Uh, but really in the south in the summer, it's, it's a hot place that is not very comfortable to live in. So um, the, the New York Times actually did a piece a few years ago and it was called How Air Conditioning Conquered America. And uh, the, the little snippet from the article states, after the 1950s, air conditioning enabled not just the construction of millions of Southern homes, but also the economic development of the South. It made possible industrial work like printing, food processing, and electrical manufacturing that would be hard to manage in sweltering heat. And it created the possibility for white collar jobs in mechanically cooled office buildings. It's hard to imagine that say Birmingham would be a big center of healthcare industry or that Atlanta would have the world's busiest airport or that Jackson would be a center for insurance if people were sitting under ceiling fans in hot human offices. Uh, so really a lot of this development became a result of air conditioning and I'll get a little bit more into that here. So how did air conditioning change life in the South and quite frankly, much of the world? Um, I'm gonna give three examples. These are not the only three examples. These are not the only things that change, but these are kind of just illustrate the point and kind of lead to a, a bigger point that I'll be making here. But the first one I'll talk about is it's called the baby dip. Uh, the next one I'll talk about is called vernacular and thermal architecture. And the last one, which is probably the most important for this presentation, is, is population shift. All right, so the first one I'm going to talk about is, is what's called the baby dip. Um, so in much of the U.S. and once again, kind of even around the world, um, birth rates tended to always drop before air conditioning, at least. Birth rates always dropped about in the nine months after the, the hottest of the summer months. So um, typically from March to May, across the world, um, especially in the Northern hemisphere, you'd see this dip in baby in uh, birth birth rates, um, typically way below, sometimes five, 10, 15% below the average would, would dip out from March to May. Um, and this was just probably due to the fact that uh, nine months prior to that time frame, people were not really interested in certain activities. Um, so I, I guess if you walk through, if you walk away with anything in this presentation, you can say, I got to hear a MnDOT engineer talk about uh, baby making. So uh, there, there's your highlight for the for the presentation today. But uh, what happened after air conditioning, which is really interesting, is that uh, especially after the wider deployment of air conditioning um, and the continued use is over time, this phenomena just kind of gradually reduced um, and receded. It, it still exists. It's still there. There's still a small dip in the in the three in that nine month after period. But you can see in this chart here in the 1940s and 1950s that pronouncement, what's called the log birth rate, you can see it's way lower than the average. Um, over the preceding decades, the 60s, 70s, and up until today, that baby dip kind of just gradually disappeared. Once again, it's still there, but it's uh, it's gradually disappeared. So kind of like to say, if you were born between March and May, and you're younger than 50, air conditioning may have a part uh, to be thankful for on your arrival uh, on planet Earth here. So, all right, so the next one um vernacular and thermal architecture so um air conditioning is is a pretty new phenomenon it, it certainly hasn't existed for very long and, and for most of human history um people lived without air conditioning it, it's not like uh everything in the south and towards the equator was a vast vacant wasteland um people live there um and you know on, on these days where people are it's 100 degrees and the humidity is 90 percent, people often ask how did people live before air conditioning this is horrible out here um and and really it, it comes back to a lot of what's, what's called vernacular and thermal architecture so vernacular architecture is really just um a local architecture and thermal architecture kind of refers to how they built the buildings and i'll go through kind of some examples here um so before the advent of air conditioning um Architecture was really built around this idea that when you built the building, um, especially in hotter climates, uh, you, you emphasize a lot of shading. The building is built around trees. We ensure that not a lot of the sunlight can hit the building. If possible, the buildings were really designed to encourage air movement through the, through the building itself. Uh, that with things like if you've ever seen a breezeway in some of those older Southern homes, they really encourage air movement to move through the house. Um, and then this other idea was these things called cupolas. Um, and a cupola, if, if you're not familiar with your architecture, um, was just essentially a, a, a vent in the roof. And what that really did was it allowed the, the hottest air in the house to escape out the roof. Um, that's keeping the house a little bit cooler during those summer months. Um, another idea that was uh, pretty much in a lot of the world, um, you can see the picture here, was this idea of what's called thermal mass, was that the building was just built so thick and so heavy was that uh, inside the building, it was much cooler because it just took so long to heat up because the walls were so thick. And you see this a lot in the Southwest, this Adobe architecture. And um, 
since it was so much cooler on the outside and the walls took so long to heat up. It took so long to heat up, but that by the end of the day uh, was when they finally got up to temperature. But by then the sun was setting. So it actually kept the building fairly warm during the evening as well or through it through the night. Um, but and then the last kind of component was this idea of small doors and small windows was that um, if, if you couldn't shade it, you know, at least build the, the, the doors really small and the windows really small. Try to discourage as much sunlight directly into the building as possible and, and keep the building cool that way. But uh, air conditioning changed all that. Um, we, we didn't really need to worry about shading anymore. We didn't need to worry about air movement from the outside. Breezeways and cupolas weren't really needed. Didn't need thermal mass anymore. That was just expensive. Um, small doors and windows. Who wants small doors and windows? I want light in my room, right? Um, so the idea really became, we're gonna seal up the building. We're gonna seal it up as tight as possible. And then just through sheer brute force, we're going to cool this building with air conditioning. And that really became the, 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 the new method uh, through across a lot of the, the, the most, across the world, across the US and especially in the South. Um, and it really um, kind of changed the way that we could uh, build buildings and the way we could build cities. Um, Air conditioning really allowed us to build mega cities in the middle of the desert. Uh, you can see here, this is just mass track housing uh, that was built across a lot of the South. Once again, tight houses, um, no real local architecture flavor, just kind of mass produced houses. Once again, sealed up tight as can be, ran, run with an air conditioner and cooled down that way. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to think about a lot of the cities in the desert now. Um, I'm leaving for Vegas tomorrow. It's gonna to be 115 degrees in Vegas for the next three days. Um, imagine going to Vegas uh, without air conditioning. Uh, this picture here is the, the built, uh, casino named, named Aria. Aria is nothing but sheer glass on the outside. Uh, you can't, I can't imagine 8,000 people coming to this hotel when it's 115 degrees out if there was not air conditioning. And then, you know, a lot of other cities around the world, this is in uh, Abu Dhabi, I believe. Um, this is, uh, it's like a 1800 foot building, but this once again, sheer glass on the outside, controlled completely by air conditioning to make this building comfortable. That's the only way people would probably ever go there was if there was a way to cool down in the middle of the summer. Um, and cities like Phoenix and, and uh, Vegas probably just would not exist in the way they do today without air conditioning. Uh, these buildings that they built today with just uh, open glass, open windows. Um, and once again, they just use sheer brute force to keep the building cool on the inside using air conditioning. Um, great, great line from uh, King of the Hill, uh, it's 100, 111 degrees. Phoenix can't really be that hot, can it? Uh, oh my God, it's like the standing on the sun. The, shitty, the city should not exist. It's a monument to man's arrogance. So uh, I, think, I think that perfectly highlights what air conditioning has allowed us to do. Um, so now the last one I wanna talk about, and this is probably the most important one, is, is this idea of population shift. So, um, the, the South before air conditioning, before the 1960s, uh, was was always been this kind of this low density, low population region with a lot of poverty. Um, and up until the 1960s, the, the South was kind of this area that was in decline. It was uh, losing population. It was not gaining uh, as much population as some other regions across the, the country. Um, but it was, it was shrinking. It was an area in decline. Um, and, and there was a, a lot of reasons for that, not just just the heat, but really uh, one, of, one of the big, big uh, movements of this was what became known as, as the Great Migration. Um, and from 1910 to 1970, uh, over 6 million African Americans fled the South. They, they left for numerous reasons. Uh, one of those reasons was really there was few economic opportunities. Um, there was, and the other hand on that was there was some new huge industrial jobs uh, popping up in the North. There's a huge need for labor in the North. Um, and the other thing was that starting in 1909, um, you see that little critter on the right there, uh, that, that, that little guy is called the boll weevil. Uh, the boll weevil uh, got introduced into the United States uh, around 1909 and the boll weevil uh, just decimated cotton fields. Um, it, it was just uh, an endemic pest that just destroyed field after field. Um, and really there became a lot of African-Americans who worked as cotton pickers, um, as, as sharecroppers, just had nothing to pick anymore. There was uh, the, the boll weevil just destroyed crops across the entire South. 
Um, so they lost those economic opportunities there. There was new jobs in the north. Um, another thing that was going on that was really rearing its ugly head was uh, Jim Crow laws were becoming really pronounced across a lot of the South. Um, Jim Crow laws, for those who don't know, were essentially uh, making African American second class citizens. They they couldn't eat in restaurants. They could uh, they could only stand on buses. Uh, they were in desegre or they were in segregated schools that were typically much less funded. Um, so across much of the old Confederacy, um, these Jim Crow laws were imposed. Um, and couple that with typical lynchings and just overt racism against African Americans, um, it, it didn't give them a lot of incentive to stay anymore and they started to flee. Um, and like I said, over 6 million people would, would leave the region. Um, now that's not to say there wasn't racism still in the North um, that still existed, but it was not nearly as bad. It was not where most had a fear for their lives or for their livelihoods. Um, so it was, it, was a new, it was a new beginning for many people. Um, and it's interesting looking at this time frame, looking back, um, African Americans really went from being primarily rural farmhands um, to an urbanized factory working demographic within a very few, within a few short generations. And um, as an author who, um, some, an author, Nicholas Lehman, who wrote about this stated, uh, the Great Migration was one of the largest and most rapid mass internal movements in history, perhaps the greatest not caused by the immediate threat of execution or starvation. In sheer numbers, it outranks the migration of any other ethnic group, Italians or Irish or Jews or Poles, to the United States. For Black people, the migration meant leaving what had always been their economic and social base in America and finding a new one. Okay. There we go. All right. So, um, so this population shift started uh, to change now. So after the 1960s, um, a lot of things kind of ha happen simultaneously um, and kind of over the decade of the 1960s, but population growth in the South became much more prevalent after this turning point in the 60s. Um, some of the things that kind of led to that was first was the Civil, Civil Rights Act of 1960. It was amended in 64 and then passed again in 1968. Um, and that, along with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, pretty much stopped this second class citizenship of a lot of African Americans. Um, and this actually has kind of led to this idea of kind of the reversal of the, the, the Great Migration was a, a lot of African Americans who had left um, started to come back to the South again because they were, they were now regular citizens. They weren't being treated as second class citizens anymore. Um, another thing that happened in the 1960s there was uh, pesticides and insecticides became a lot more effective, um, along with a lot of um, better crop, uh, cotton crops. Uh, the boll weevil was not as, um, as uh, problematic as it was before. So really the, the cropland of cotton started to return again. So a lot of those jobs were, were needed again. Uh, so those economic opportunities were returned. Um, but another thing that happened was just um, the South having been kind of uh, low density under underdeveloped. Um, there was a lot of opportunities to, to, to buy land, to, to grow economically, uh, both for businesses and for individuals. So this kind of this combination of undeveloped land, cheap land, and then the, the South has historically been kind of a, an area of lower taxes. So this uh, opened up a lot of opportunities as well. Uh, but really kind of the thing that drove or enabled a lot of this too was just this idea of affordable air conditioning. People could afford to buy, maintain, and run their air conditioners through the entire summer, making the South a much more hospitable place. All right, so it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, a lot of the, the terminology kind of has shifted from this idea of the South to the Sun Belt, it, it kind of started to change across the country. So before 1960, we kind of saw this steady decline of, of population across the South, but changing in 1960, going into the 1970s and going forward, uh, the South started to grow, started to grow a lot. Uh, by 2000, this area had gone from a, an area of about 30% of the country population wise to 35, 36%. Um, by 2020, this was 38% of the country now lives in the South. Um, not, not as, uh, maybe that doesn't sound very big, but that represents uh, millions upon millions of people moving to the South at a much greater rate than what was ever anticipated. Um, so, so just to kind of understand the context of this, um, once again, that, that five to 8% may not sound that impressive, but really the, the U.S., if you kind of look as a total of the U.S. across um, from 1950 to 19, 2020, grew about 119%. Population doubled and then a little bit some, but uh, the South clipped along at a much faster rate. The, the, the South, uh, defined by the, the U.S. Census Bureau, grew by about 168% from 1950 to 2020. Um, if you look at some of these individual states, uh, Florida grew by 700% 
from 1950 to 2020. Florida was a very low population, low density state uh, before air conditioning. Uh, now it's the third largest state population wise, 700% uh, in 70 years. Uh, California grew by 400%, Texas nearly just as much, 400%. Um, if you look at the entire South versus the rest of the US, 40% of the total US growth in the US uh, from 1950 going forward occurred in the South. It's, it's really been kind of the juggernaut of the US um, since, since 1950. So those are kind of my three examples, um, kind of walking through the baby dip vernacular and thermal architecture, and then some of the population shift. So that, that's how air conditioning really changed a lot across the South. So I know what you're all thinking, right? You're, you're kind of all scratching your heads. You're probably giving me that bewildered look and thinking, you know, Derek, what does any of this have to do with pedestrian fatalities and TZD? Is, is this just Derek didn't talk about air conditioning because he likes air conditioning? And I do like air conditioning, but there, there's more to the story than that. I promise. All right. So once again, just jumping back real quick, um, you know, we, we talked about some of those numbers, 700% in Florida, 168% across a lot of the South. Um, those, those numbers, um, this extreme growth led to development at an epic and even more importantly, at an unprepared scale. Cities, counties, and states were largely just not ready for these big movements of people coming into their region. Uh, it was not anticipated. It was not fully understood until it was well underway. Um, and that'll, that'll be important here, and, and we'll get to that here. So here's kind of the hypothesis. This is, this is the working hypothesis I'm kind of operating under. Um, but really, it's air conditioning is developed, right? So we kind of talked about that. Um, with the advent of air conditioning, people can handle living in the South. Um, the, the, the hot sweltering humid area that was once the south in the middle of the summer where nobody wanted it to be, people can handle that now. People can, can stand living in the south because they can stay inside and they can stay within their air conditioning. Um, with that uh, comfort known, people start moving to the south. Uh, it's, it's not this unbearable place anymore. It's a pretty bearable place most of the year. And it's uh, certainly better than Minnesota winters, as most of us can attest to. And um, with that, land development starts to move pretty quickly. Um, and and at the same time, this is kind of the same time where the, the automobile was deified across a lot of the US. So everybody wanted a car, everybody wanted to drive everywhere all the time. Um, there was no reason why you didn't need to do anything outside of your car if you needed to go anywhere. So land was developing quickly and people wanted to drive everywhere. It kind of changed the way we built our cities, which is really important. So, um, the, and I'll get into this a little bit, but as the land develops and it develops quickly, this led a lot of agencies and, and government um, roadway authorities to allow the development to happen, happen without proper access management. And that'll play a really critical here is that because of how quickly these developments wanted to come in, um, agencies were not prepared to, to develop the roadway networks correctly and uh, proper access management was not applied. And I'll show that. And, and this is kind of the central thesis is that poorly planned and designed roads lead to fatalities and on especially a lot of these roads that leads to pedestrian fatalities and we'll talk about that now so that's my central thesis or hypothesis all right so in order to explain this a little bit i need to i need to jump back a little bit to um some basic transportation 101 um if uh, you are not in the in the road authority world uh this will probably come new to you but um transportation has two functions. It really only has two function, functions. Um, and this goes for roadways and this goes for pretty much any transportation system out there, whether it's vehicles, whether it's, or I'm sorry, whether it's airplanes, whether it's trains, whether it's shipping. Um, transportation has two functions, mobility and access. Really, it's, it's either about moving people and goods or it's getting them to their final destination. Um, and that's really all a transportation system is, is really all about mobility and all about access. So the, the trouble with uh, roadway systems, with, with vehicular travel and vehicular transportation is um, with roads, these two things directly conflict with each other. Um, um, you, you either want a road that uh, roads work really well when they're all mobility or they work really well when they're all local roads. Um, so if you think about a local road or if you think about an access type of roadway, think about your residential neighborhood. Um, it's got a lot of access um, and mobility goes way down. It's a pretty low speed environment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but if we want to increase mobility, if we want to be able to go faster than what we typically go in our residential neighborhoods, um, we need to remove access or we need to start constraining access um, and start to think about like the freeway system. The freeway system is completely access controlled um, and every single access onto and off of that freeway is controlled and it's usually done through ramps and interchanges. And those are our highest mobility roadways. So um, with that, 
it's um like I said, all mobility interstates, uh, these, these tend to be actually our, our safest facilities in a, in a vehicle miles traveled sense of the word. Um, they, they tend to have the lowest fatality rate, they tend to have the lowest crash rates, um, and that's just because they have full mobility and full access control. Um, you look on the other side, kind of these residential streets um, where it's, it's all about access, um, the, the function is known, the speeds are, tend to be low, the drivers understand the expectations of that roadway. These tend to be our safest roads as well. All access roads, these residential city streets tend to be our safest roads. Um, the problem is really when we try to mix these things together, when we try to say, um, hey, we want a road that can provide both mobility and access, that's where we start to get into trouble. This is really where we start to see more conflicts. We start to see more crashes. We start to see more speed, uh, higher severity crashes. Um, and there's just a lot more distraction on these roadways. So really, um, and this is a, a graph on the on the right here. This is from our uh, this is from a report that MnDOT did years ago about access management and access density. And basically, as access density goes up, and this doesn't matter if you're in the rural or the uh, urban environment, as access goes up, crashes go up. Um, and it doesn't matter the type of facility, whether it's a two lane, whether it's a four lane, whether it's a um, expressway. Uh, just as access goes up, crashes go up. That'll be really key. So. Um, Minnesota, we've largely been spared the worst of this phenomena. Um, and, and this just probably comes from the fact that Minnesota and the South developed just very differently, um, likely just due to some timing and some history and, and a bunch of other factors, but those are probably the biggest two one. The South was under this very quick development pattern. Um, city officials, county officials, state officials were really breathing down roadway agencies um, next to say, hey, just, just give them the access, let this business come give them the access off the highway, um, it, it'll be fine. We, we need to get this business in your businesses. Businesses wanna be here, houses wanna come along. Um, give them access to the highway, what's the big deal? Um, fortunately here in Minnesota, Minnesota has had a, a pretty good partnership with our local transportation officials um, to the point where when land development does want to occur, uh, we can try to make sure they follow what's called the transportation hierarchy. Um, really this idea that if you kind of look on the graph on the right here, um, the roads in red, though, those are what we call our principal arterials. Those are really this idea of those are for moving traffic. Those are for moving vehicles. Um, and let's keep access limited to those because we want those to be movers of, of vehicles. Um, and then as you get kind of onto the blue and the yellow, those are more for getting the vehicles off of those principal arterials and start to get them to the local connections. Um, and, and really, if you can get a good transportation network set up like this, where you have good principal arterials, you have good minor arterials, and then ultimately local roads, these tend to be the safest systems as a whole, is when you can have really good um, hierarchy of your, of your roadway system. Um, and, and Minnesota has largely been able to follow this, and we're certainly not perfect by any means, but we, we've been able to plan well ahead. And really, one of the kind of the key advantages I think uh, I've kind of learned in some of this is uh, MnDOT, we, we, we own the big roads. Um, and we can really say to a lot of business development that's coming along is that, um, especially working well with our local partners is, hey, MnDOT here, we're, we're in the mobility game. We are here to move vehicles. Um, if, if you wanna develop this land, if you wanna develop this parcel, if you wanna put in a new big box store, um, go get your access from the locals. Get, get, get your access off the local roadway. We're not gonna interrupt our, our, our arterial system for, for your driveway. Uh, go get your driveway from the locals. And then that kind of spurs the locals to develop their transportation network. Um, and MnDOT has provided a lot of support, both financial and technical to do that. Um, and, and it's really led to a much better system. Um, in the South, it really became give the access to promote the development. Just, just let them have the access and let it develop. Um, and, and this kind of, uh, this is this little graphic is right out of our MnDOT's uh, right of way, our, uh, sorry, access management guide. Um, and it really kind of comes down to this is that for a lot of roads in a lot of places, um, you have a roadway there. Um, if I can kind of highlight that, I don't know. But just one one driveway, one house off of a, an, an arterial is really not that big of a deal. It typically doesn't interrupt much. But over time, um, development starts to occur. And you know we just start to allow one access point on another access point along the roadway. Um, and then the problem becomes is this kind of just keeps compounding each other. There's more access, as I showed access, more access means more crashes. The accesses keep coming in, they keep coming in denser, they come in with bigger lots, um, bigger buildings, bigger traffic generators. Um, and as that road develops, it just starts to get a lot of access on there. And the problem is now um, it's the best solutions to managing crashes and, and traffic safety along that roadway are now gone. We have a lot of access and it's hard to change access after it's been established. 
So I'm going to show a video here that kind of highlights this. Um, I see there's a question. Derek, do you have a brother named Dave Luer? I do not have a brother named Dave Luer. Um, all right, so let me see if I can get this right. All right, so we want to go to here, share. All right, and I'm going to click play. Hopefully this works. If you live in the United States, then this will likely look familiar to you. Multiple lanes of car traffic, wide highway sized lanes, giant signs, parking lots, and especially lots and lots of driveways with vehicles changing lanes and entering and exiting those driveways. This is the single most dangerous type of transportation facility in America's entire road network. And it is dangerous for every single type of traveler. As far as government officials in the United States are concerned, there is no special term for a facility like this other than road or highway. But this is far from a normal road or highway, and the traffic safety challenges that this facility presents are qualitatively different. To improve our ability to think and talk creatively about these safety challenges, it's helpful to have a special term that we can use. About 10 years ago, a civil engineer in Minnesota named Chuck Marone observed that because these facilities attempt to provide nearly unlimited direct vehicle access to adjacent properties like a street, as well as high-speed vehicle mobility like a road, the right word for the facility is strode, a combination of street and road. Just as the coinage of the new word smog, a combination of smoke and fog, a century ago helped us to more clearly perceive a qualitatively new phenomenon that had not previously existed, Strode does the same for us. Where do Strodes come from? One way is for a new road to slowly evolve into one without anyone really noticing. A pre-Strode road might not have much vehicle traffic. Driving is pretty simple and straightforward, perhaps even tranquil. But of course, drivers need gasoline for their cars, and so it seemed to make sense to have a gas station on this road and perhaps another business that served the needs of drivers. But once those seemingly innocent decisions were made, an access precedent was set. The next person came in and said, hey, look at my neighbor. He has a driveway onto this road. Why can't I get one too? So he got a driveway too, and so did the next person and the next. The change was gradual. Nothing happened overnight, but slowly and with each decision, the character of the road started to change. In addition to the proliferation of driveways, traffic volumes were also now increasing. There was no plan for this. There was no vote. Nobody was really thinking about the longer term picture. The road just continued to slowly evolve in obedience to some perverse internal logic of its own with drivers, pedestrians, and everyone else as passive spectators until it eventually became a qualitatively different thing, not a road any longer, but a strode. Probably a majority of Delawareans drive daily on strobes like this. They are the arteries of the suburbs we built after World War II. But even though it's easy to take roads like this for granted as an inevitable part of our world, we shouldn't. Because these roads are deadly. This is a plot of 38,000 crashes in urban and suburban areas in seven different states. Each of the lines in this chart corresponds to a different type of road cross section but irrespective of the cross-section, crashes increase as the number of access points increase. A couple of dozen driveways per mile was associated with about a doubling of the crash rate, and the increase to the crash rate doesn't plateau. Every new driveway continues to increase the per mile crash rate by two to 4% per driveway added in the space of a mile. As bad as strobes are for drivers, they are even worse for pedestrians. A recent study looked at the deadliest stretches of roads for pedestrians in the United States and found that essentially all of them were strodes. The single deadliest section of the strode in America is US-19 in Port Ritchie, Florida. US-19 runs north to south down Florida's Gulf Coast and bisects the small community of Port Ritchie. At its widest, US-19 spans eight lanes big box stores and strip malls that sit far away from the road with large parking lots in between. 
as on Delaware Strode's, there aren't a lot of pedestrians walking around on US 19, but there are some. I walked along US 19 about three or four uh, times a week, touring from work. It's a lot cheaper than taking a bus. Uh, I was uh, crossing uh, uh, the crosswalk, someone was turning and she bumped right into me. I had uh, a few bumps, bruises, you know, some cracked ribs. I have a hearing disability, which causes severe vertigo and issues with balance. So it's not wise to drive every single day. I am afraid of either getting bumped or yelled at or honked at or cut off every day. Both streets and roads are important. Streets are where we often live and come together for community and commerce. And we use roads when we either need to travel between our productive places, or we need to move goods to and from wider markets. But strodes are a mistake. We are trying to get them to function as both a road and a street, but we end up with something that is neither a good road nor a good street, but rather a deadly and malfunctioning hybrid of the two. As we work towards a transportation system where everyone gets home, we have no higher priority than fixing the problem of Delaware's strodes. All right. This would probably be a good time to make a shout out to my uh, my friends in Delaware who I originally saw this presentation, at least this video with, um, and, and thought I would bring it here to Minnesota. So um, are you guys seeing my, my screen again? Is that popping back up? Oh, I don't need to do that. Yes, it is, Gary. There we go. Okay. So the, the video kind of highlighted this really well and kind of talked about some of the things I already hit on. So I'm glad it, it hit those again. Um, so, so like uh, kind of what the video is saying there is as these roads develop, a, a lot of good solutions start to disappear because we just have so much access, so many buildings, uh, so much is built up in the environment here that it really becomes a hard ship to turn at that point. So uh, looking at this, looking at uh, what is Smart Growth for America did some really good analysis I thought I would share here. And uh, nine out of the top 10 states for pedestrian fatalities occurred in the South. Uh, Delaware was number two, as you can probably see in the video. Um, I recently went out to De uh, Delaware to kind of look through their system and kind of help them maybe figure out what's next, where should they be heading to. Um, but really, it, it's really interesting looking at this. What, what Smart Growth for America did was they actually looked at uh, congressional districts. They broke up uh, all the South into congressional districts. The South isn't a monolithic block, so they thought it'd be more interesting to kind of break these up into uh, congressional districts. One of the big advantages of that is every congressional district has about the same number of people in it. So you could kind of have at least a good baseline to see what is occurring. Um, and what they did was they took those congressional districts and then they looked at the number of pedestrian fatalities in each of those, um, each of those congressional districts. And what they found was uh, pretty much nine out of the top 10 congressional districts in the US were once again, all in the South, primarily in Florida, uh, but uh, there was one in Arizona, one in Nevada. Um, and, and it wasn't just like a little bit higher. These were in order of magnitude of two to three times higher than the U.S. average. So um, something was going on in these in these areas that was was generating these pedestrian fatalities. Um, and you can see here where, where they're kind of distributed across the country. Um, and, and looking at each of these individual districts, at least the top six I, I looked at quickly, um, you can see here they all experienced a remarkably high growth, especially the, the second district there, uh, or this number two there, Nevada's first district, which is Las Vegas and the southern suburbs. This is an area that grew by 2,600% from 1950 to 2020. Um, Vegas uh, was once a lonely little pit stop between uh, Salt Lake City and Los Angeles. Now it's a major metropolitan area of over 2 million people and uh, a draw from around the world for people who want to go gamble, like me. Um, so Vegas, um, you know, these are areas that all grew at unprecedented rates um, versus the, the U.S. average. Um, so the video talked a little bit about U.S. 19. I thought I'd share some a little bit more about U.S. 19 here, um, and especially the section here in, in Pasco County, Florida. Um, this is an area that's north of Clearwater and Tampa. It's got really dense land use, as you can probably see in the video there. Very little access management. I would even argue probably no access management. Anybody who wanted access to Highway 19 got it. Um, and this road kind of sits in this weird place of it's got really high speeds, 45 to 55 miles per hour along a lot of it. Um, six lanes at least through most of it, plus turn lanes. Um, and if looking at, oh, there we go. And if, if you look at this road, um, where does this thing sit on the functional classification system? 
it sits right in the middle, just as the video was kind of explaining it. It's not really a, it's not really a freeway. It's not really a city or local connection. It sits right in this middle of, of the, the functional classification system. Um, and looking at the access densities and looking at where it falls on the crash rate, it's on the high end. Uh, this thing has a lot of access points and it has a lot of crashes and it has a lot of deadly crashes as well. Um, so, so as the video kind of highlighted, it's not really a highway. It sucks as a highway. It's not definitely not a street. Um, there's plentiful of access out here. As you saw in the video, there's a lot of transit out there. Um, there's apartments and dense residential that kind of line this whole thing as well, which leads to a lot of people walking and needing to get to their destination. A lot of lanes, a lot of speed, a lot of exposure for pedestrians trying to cross that roadway. Kind of got everything bad going for it. Um, and the, the data from this thing is atrocious. Um, in 2017 to 2022, in Pasco County alone, this is just one segment of US 19, uh, 48 pedestrians were killed in that five year segment, in five years on that one segment, uh, which is shockingly high. Um, as a comparison, uh, Ramsey County here in Minnesota in that same five year period, uh, we saw 41 pedestrian fatalities in the entire county across all the roadways in Ramsey County. And Ramsey County is our second highest population county. It's actually larger than Pasco County. So uh, to have 48 pedestrian fatalities on one stretch of road is, is just shocking. Um, and looking at Pasco County overall, uh, from 1950 to 19 to 2022, 2,900% growth. This is a county that grew at a huge rate, unprecedented. Um, it, it, and it was a sustained growth of 4.8% 4 from 1950 going onwards. Uh, if you look at the U.S. over that whole time frame as well, the average is about 1.1% growth across the country. So uh, this was an area, this is an area that had a lot of growth, and that growth was likely linked to the air conditioner. So um, there's a great book out there. Uh, they mentioned in the video, Chuck Marone. Uh, there's this book called Confessions of a Recovering Engineer. Uh, he goes a lot into depth about this uh, Strode concept and how mixing access and management is, is um, or I'm sorry, access and, and speed really just don't act, don't work really well. Um, he's, he's even used the term as the, it's, it's the futon of the transportation system. Um, if, if anybody has or had or ever used a futon, uh, you know, it's this idea that you can have a couch during the day and you can have a bed at nighttime, but if you ever sit on a cut on a futon, it's a horrendous couch. If you sleep on it at night, your back will ache for the next week because it's a terrible bed as well. So not only do you have a terrible, not only do you have a couch and a bed, but you have a terrible couch and a terrible bed because it doesn't work as either. This is the same concept as Strode's. So, um, you know, once again, my hypothesis, air conditioning is developed. People can move to the south. People start moving there. The land developed quickly and people want to drive all at the same time. The land developed without that proper access management. And this has led to a lot of pedestrian fatalities across the South. Um, so, so what's our lessons learned in all this? What do we, what do we learn today? What do I hope that you learned today? Um, for those of you who are on the city, county, and even the, the, the trunk highway system that deal with land development and access management, um, those cities and counties and, and transportation officials deal with these land development decisions all the time. They are pressed like no other to give access to roadways. It is um, constant. It is, uh, everybody wants development. Um, everybody wants that development. Everybody wants that big box. Everybody wants those, that next housing development. Um, and really for a lot of elected officials, um, traffic safety really isn't on the top of their mind because it's just not clearly an issue. They don't understand the issue between access management and traffic safety. Uh, they just see the development and, and they know development looks good. Um, and, and the other issue is too, that development can come, they can give them the access. Um, and as the video, and I kind of tried to highlight too, is, is these issues take years or even decades to really manifest themselves. It doesn't happen overnight. Just adding that one axis is rarely the problem. But as the axis to start to build, as the traffic volume starts to build, we get more and more problems. And it, that just takes some time to manifest. So it's not even clear to a lot of people who allow these access points that these led to problems years later. Um, so the, the, the big takeaway really is, you know, access management, land development, and traffic safety are all really intricately linked and linked way more than people probably realize. Um, it takes the, and, and, you know, really, if, if, if you're in one of these positions and you got the, the local city council or the county commissioner breathing down your neck to get this development approved, um, take the time so that they understand this. Uh, this can be a really big, uh, a really big decision. Um, the, the city and county wants that development. It, they want to make sure it happens. Um, but, you know, let's try to make sure it happens in the right way and at the right place and at the right time. Uh, because the real big issue is a lot of these roads you saw, there's not a lot of good options once this is done. Um, once that ship has sailed, 
it is hard to turn around. Um, it is hard to fix a strode just because of the way it's development and, and the way the, the businesses have all uh, popped up along there. So uh, that's the end of the air conditioning and pedestrian fatalities. I'm gonna jump back to our, our jump back in our way back machine here again um, and ask you guys, where would you put the armor? Um, I don't have a direct way to polling people. If anybody wants to throw something in the chat, um, go, go ahead. Uh, but you know, once again, Abraham Wald was looking at this. He was trying to figure out, you know, based on the bullet holes, where should we add the armor? Um, and fortunately, um, you know, a lot of the generals had a pretty good idea. They thought they knew the answer, but Abraham Wald came to them with, with the solution. Um, he understood this data. He, he got into it and he started figuring something out pretty quickly. Um, he, he was looking at these diagrams and he, he looked at the, the engine casings and he saw no bullet holes. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the fuel lines and kind of the main strut within the wing structure, no bullet holes, kind of interesting. Uh, the cockpit rarely had bullet holes. If it did, it was, it was few and far between, but the, the cockpit really kind of typically had no bullet holes. Um, and really what Abraham Wald came to realize was that the lack of bullets were the spots where you'd want to put the armor. The lack of bullet holes were the spots where the planes were getting hit and getting brought down. These were the weakest spots in the plane um, if a bullet or a piece of flak hit the engine casings, hit the cockpit, hit the fuel systems and the struts, that brought the plane down. He realized what he was looking at with these diagrams was what's called survivorship bias. These were the planes that were making it back home. What he wasn't seeing were the planes that were getting shot down. So Abraham Wald made the recommendation, put the armor where you don't have bullet holes. And he had to explain it to the army uh, quite a bit to why they would do it. And they did this. And it remarkably increased the, the, the survival of the, of the planes coming back. And the army and corporations still do this to this day is trying to understand uh, survivorship bias um, to understand what are we really looking at so we really understand our data. Um, so what was the lesson at all that? Um, not only is that I think super interesting, but um, you know, it, it really speaks to me as you know, know your data. Um, understand where it is coming from. Uh, not only what is your data, you know, being presented to you as, but what, what's missing? Why, why is this data here versus what we're not seeing? So uh, that's really important. Uh, and this kind of goes back to some of that access management is that um, oftentimes where we want to put an access um, and, and a lot of city or county or elected officials don't understand is they'll say, there's no safety issue there. What's, what's the problem? Um, there, there's no crashes there today. If, if we had an access, what's the difference? Um, and, and it really goes back to, once again, the, the bullet holes are missing there. Um, there's no crashes or no safety because we haven't introduced access or, or issues yet. Um, so just because there's no crashes or safety issues there today doesn't mean there won't be one there in the future. Um, you know, so where are your bullet holes missing? Um, and, and kind of the bigger message in all of this too is just to understand we we as engineers, we as enforcement, we as planners, we as everybody on this call, we are often subject to forces that are way beyond our control. Um, think back to the COVID, think back to smartphones, and now we're looking at the legalization of marijuana. These are all things that have huge influences on our industry and on our business, and we had almost no control over them. And we really have to just go back to our principles, especially with this access management stuff. We understand that more access means more problems. We know this. Um, let's use that to our advantage. Let's not get ourselves into more strodes. Let's build ourselves uh, and build our roadway network correctly. So uh, long story short, once again, access management and development and safety are all intricately linked. And with that, I'm done. So uh, that's a wrap. Stay cool. And uh, I'll try to take some questions at the end here. So thank you. See a couple in the box here. I'll maybe we'll just take them one at a time. Would that be a good strategy, Brian? Yeah, um, I was just going to note um, there's a ton of stuff there to chew on. So I learned a lot about World War II. I learned about the history of printing. I learned about the baby dip. I didn't. I had no idea about the baby dip. Um, history of architecture. Um, the bull weevil, the population shift, there's a, there's a lot of stuff there that, you know, provides good context for, you know, how we um, ended up where we are today. Um, and I had never connected the dots in the way that you did. So I appreciate that. And we even got a, a Simpsons and a King of the Hill reference as well. So um, I know one of the questions early was um, around education. And so you know, to the point that there's a lot of stuff here that maybe people don't understand. Um, 
how do we go about um, educating those that really need to know about this so that um, you know, we can get in front of it where we can. I think you've noted, you know, once once a lot of these design elements are in place along a roadway, it's, it's very difficult to back up the bus, but um, how do we get the word out, you know, because development continues, you know, new roads are built or improved. Um, how do we get the, the word out to those that really should be hearing this story? Yeah, and I, I don't know if I have the magic bullet on that one too. Um, I, I feel like, you know, part of my role is, is just to continue to educate the best I can. Uh, you know, presentations like this, uh, we try to get out to counties and cities and give safety talks as well when we can. But, um, you know, sometimes access management gets lost in there because um, most people are focused really on, you know, this intersection or, or this one entrance and they sometimes fail to see that it's actually a bigger problem. So um, I'm hoping that we can get this message out more. I'm, I'm trying to do more of these things where we try to spread the word, the, the, the message about access management. Um, it's, it's not a sexy, glorious topic by any means, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge for sure. Yeah, and I, I think there is a safe system element here too. And, um, you know, we talk about safe system, you know, we end up on the engineering side, talking about um, specific solutions, you know, we 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 talk about roundabouts and we talk about cable median guardrail and J turns and um, and all those are a huge part of safe system. But I think we need to remember that um, you know the the way we develop our roadway systems is important too, and the decisions we make through that process. Um, you know, making uh, those type of systematic decisions. Uh, also sets the stage for, you know, how well we reduce the risk of life-changing crashes. So I think that's a good, good reminder. Um, just scrolling through some of the other, so there's a question about, you know, what, what can we do with the strodes in terms of um, addressing speeds? Yeah, and it's, um, that, that's a real challenge is vehicle speed is always really challenging. Um, you know, one there's, there's been kind of two lines of approach that people have thought about how you handle strodes, especially once they're built is um, kind of the one measure is you, you really reduce a lot of the lanes. Maybe get down to a single lane in each direction, better access control or not access control intersection control at those points. Somebody pointed out, you know, right turns only and, and roundabouts. That's certainly an option. So that's, that's one thing that you, that could be done. That sometimes that's challenging just based on the traffic volumes that are being dealt with. Um, and that, it's really hard to get communities and businesses to buy into that. Did we lose Derek or is that me? He froze up for me too. Yeah, and maybe to finish, I can finish a little bit on um, kind of the, well, what do we do on the strodes? I, um, you know, one of the things that we can do, and I mentioned J-turns and a lot of times we talk about um, J turns on our high speed expressways and um, trying to deal with those uh, deadly T bone crashes. You know, that's an approach that can be taken on other roads as well in, in the nature of the access, right? And so we can, can um, kind of change how people are accessing uh, those types of facilities, making left turns or, or crossing those roadways uh, in the way we set up the median or the way we design the, the access itself. So um that's definitely a topic uh and i think we covered most of the main questions if there's i haven't been watching the chat linda i don't know if there's anything else in the chat hey brian Yep. Eric's power went out at his house. Oh, okay. Well, that, that'll do it. So I, we're at about five after we have, I have a few wrap up things. So why don't I jump into those? If Derek is able to rejoin, 
um, before 11.15, then maybe we can get back to some of the questions or allow him to finish his response. Otherwise, Linda, if you want to pop up the slides. Do we want to, um, how about the evaluation survey? Do we have the QR code for that? There we go. Yeah, we just, we'd really appreciate if everyone can take a minute to fill out our, our survey. Um, uh, there's also a link to it, I believe, in the, in the chat box. Or follow the QR code uh, on your screen. And we, I know I can speak on behalf of um, TZD leadership. We, we, we definitely read these responses and, and we take this information into account for future events. Um, so if you're willing to take just a few minutes and give us your thoughts and reactions, we really appreciate it. And Derek is trying to get back on, but we'll see how it goes. Okay. Uh, we also wanted to note that uh, our next traffic safety hot dish is scheduled for Tuesday, October. Is it October 17th, Linda? That is correct. October 17th. This is Tuesday. Correct. So um, we hope you can uh, punch that into your calendar if it's not already there and join us. We'll send out more information on topic in the future. And then we also want to remind people of our statewide conference. And this year, it'll be November 14th and 15th at the Mayo Civic Center in Rochester. Uh, participant registration will be available at www.minnesotatzd.org in mid-September. But registration is open now for those who are willing to be a sponsor or an exhibitor. And Derek was able to join us. Welcome back. I'm back. Thanks. My uh, my power died. I guess there's a lot of things you can plan for in life, but uh, power going out in the middle of a presentation is not one of them. So, <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want your air conditioning to go out there. It, uh, apparently, everyone was running the air conditioning, or the uh, the air conditioning gods that decided to stop me in my tracks. <laughs> So Derek, I just went through kind of some of the wrap up stuff. Um, so I don't know if you want to kind of finish your response. I think we were talking about, you know, how we deal with speeds on some of those roads. Yeah, I think um, I think I was going with the, the direction of, yeah, yeah, there's been kind of two directions ahead. One is to kind of head down this path of, of fewer lanes with, with uh, like roundabouts as the intersection control. Um, the other way, kind of a, a pre, a, an example I gave when I was out in Delaware was the 394 conversion was, you kind of go from this uh, Strody type road to a, a full blown freeway, which is an option. It's a viable option, but it's an expensive, complex, uh, not easy option for sure too. But that's kind of the other way to go. Um, so uh, strodes typically don't work well, but uh, the options after them is not that great either. So once again, it kind of gets back to this idea of good planning and, and making sure we understand where we're going uh, before we go there, so. There was a question about any thoughts on um, types of vehicles, so trucks, SUVs, and the impact on pedestrian fatalities. And I, I think when we, so when we're talking about these kinds of strodes where, um, you know, they're mobility corridors that, uh, you know, we need to move freight on, they're, and they're heavy commercial at times, right? Uh, and then you mix it with, you know, the need for pedestrians to use it to get to where they're going to get on and off of transit. Uh, that's part of what's happening on those facilities, correct? Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, that that tends to be part of the issue, too, is we, we've kind of got a, a pretty mixed fleet on a lot of these roads that are heading to a destination on that road. So definitely a challenge we see on the, the state road system specifically. There's a question for the top 10 states with pedestrian fatalities. Was that the raw number of pedestrian fatalities or was that the rate? The top 10 there? Um, I believe that's by rate because that's how Delaware would fall in there. Um, but, but yeah, if you look at, um, I think there's some other graphics out there too, like half of the pedestrian fatalities occur at, you know, if you had Florida, Texas, and California, those, those three or four states and Arizona and in Nevada, 
those three or four states make up about half of the total pedestrian fatalities in the U.S. every year. I, I probably got some of those numbers wrong, but that's it, it is amazing how many of the pedestrian fatalities occur in just those few states. So I'm suggesting you should be a history professor. I'm against that. I think you should. I think you should keep working in traffic safety personally. I'll just do it as my side gig. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just a note that, you know, the bullet holes example is a good one because it can also kind of um, connect with, you know, maybe some latent demand type things, you know, so where areas where people know it's dangerous and so they avoid it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, that's a good example. How about anything on connected technologies? Yeah, I think, you know, it's connected technologies one is an interesting one. I, I'm not sure how that all plays into. I mean, I think connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles will certainly be an important part of traffic safety going forward. Um, but, you know, I, I always think of 10 or 11 years ago when I started this, started in this field, a lot of people said, well, autonomous vehicles will solve all of our problems and it's only a decade away and here we are a decade later and I feel like we're just as close as we were then. So um, will it save us one day? Maybe, but I don't think it's going to save us immediately here. So we still have to continue to plan for um, as if we're, they're not coming, in my opinion. Here's a good one. So what about um, crosswalks and things such as hybrid beacons, RFBs, um, pedestrian signals? What about putting those in on crosswalks? And, and what is Minnesota doing? And it's probably a pretty timely question. We're, we're putting some effort in right now on kind of revamping um, our pedestrian portion of our traffic engineering manual, and this is getting a lot of discussion. Yeah, and, and certainly things like uh, crosswalks and pedestrian refuge islands and hybrid beacons and, and RFPs are, are all part of the solution, especially on but they got to be the right place in the right time. They're not a universal fix uh, for any given circumstance. They have to be done in the right place in the right context. Um, and, and even with some regards to the fact that we want them to be used in places pedestrians will use them. One of one thing we want to be careful to violate is uh, not to violate is uh, putting these things where nobody will ever use them. And that just kind of lets uh, drivers disregard them. So we want to make sure we're using them in the right place in the right time. That's extraordinarily important. Um, one thing is, is you look at a lot of these strodes. Um, these solutions don't work just because of the way the strode that, especially the ones that highlighted in this presentation, just will not work. When you have 20, 30, 40,000 vehicles a day moving at 55 miles an hour, um, our RFPs and hybrid beacons just do not work. It's, it's just not enough. Um, and, and that's really where we kind of put ourselves in this really bad geometric problem where the highway is designed as a highway. It's not designed for people to stop and let pedestrians cross. So um, the, those solutions I mentioned are listed in that box, certainly great solutions in the right context. They're not one size fits all. And certainly on a strode with these super high volumes and super high speeds, they're pretty much a non-starter. And that, that even adds more to the complexity and the challenge that, that these roads are bringing to the table. Yep, and I see Bruce Parker's question there. Yeah, you know, great separation is, is certainly a, a great solution, right? That works wonderfully, just to keep them separated. Big challenge too, though, is great separation isn't cheap. Uh, that, that comes with a pretty high price tag to it. So, um, and as we've learned in Minnesota and a lot of places of the country, uh, along the country too, is if, if your grade separation doesn't really make sense from a topography perspective, people just don't use it. They'll, <laughs> they're, they're not going to walk a quarter mile out of their way to go under a tunnel or over a bridge if they can just walk across the street. So uh, sometimes even the best intentions, um, people tend to be, you know, I, I don't want to say people are lazy in general, but you know, if it's walking a mile to get over a street or just walking across the street, they're probably going to just walk across the street. But, you know, we're, we're fighting human nature. Um, and uh, human nature is I want to get to where I want to go quickly. So, yep, our time is valuable for sure. So, a lot of uh, kudos to you, Derek, in the questions and answers as well. Again, we appreciate all the information. Like I said, I learned a ton of stuff on on things I didn't even know I was going to. So I definitely appreciate that. Um, 
And just a reminder, uh, there is the link in the chat. If you haven't done the evaluation yet, please go in there and do that. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you at the uh, state conference and also at our next uh, TZD Hot Dish event. So I wanna thank Derek once again, and thank you all for, uh, for joining us this morning and be safe. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for attending.